All right, everybody, welcome to uh, the last class in module three, focused in on gender. And today we're gonna be talking about some of Helen Fisher's work, which you had to uh, listen to for today's class, and uh, the, the kind of connections that she draws between biology, psychology, and these ideas about masculine, masculinity and femininity that um, shape the way we think about partnership, love, monogamy, but also gender roles in society. So let's dive in and we're gonna start not with Helen Fisher, but with Charles Darwin. So in 1871, Charles Darwin wrote, man is more courageous, pugnacious, and energetic than woman. and has a more inventive genius. Woman seems to differ from man, chiefly in her greater tenderness and less selfishness. Darwin in this quote really portrays man as an aggressor and woman as a kind of nurturer. These gender roles uh, Darwin believed were kind of inherited from a distant past and were linked to evolution. This kind of superior uh, male intelligence that Darwin posits uh, arose because young men had to defend their families, hunt for their joint subsistence, attack enemies, and make weapons. And this idea that Darwin uh, purported about men being kind of more aggressive and intelligent than women was certainly not unique to him. Paul Broca in 1861 uh, is an eminent uh, French neuro neurologist who also echoed kind of Darwin's beliefs in feminine intellectual inferiority. So what Broca did was to calculate the brain weights of over 100 men and women whose bodies were autopsied in Paris hospitals during the 19th century. What Broca's study found was that women were, were less intelligent than men based on brain weight. But had Broca actually corrected his calculations for the smaller body size of women, he likely would have come to a much different conclusion. This kind of sexist idea that men were more intelligent than women saw bitter reaction after World War I. Specifically, anthropologist Margaret Mead was a, among one of the early intellectual leaders of the 1920s to argue that traits, the kind of traits we think of as masculine and feminine, actually have very little to do with biological sex. Instead, she argues that culture molded ideas about masculinity and femininity. This idea that culture shapes how we think about gender roles is what anthropologists call cultural determinism. Basically, cultural determinism is the idea that people are essentially similar at their core beings and that upbringing, or what we might think of as nurture, really makes the salient differences between men and women. The 19th, in, during the 1930s and the following decades, there was a whole bunch of scientific theories proclaiming that men and women were actually inherently alike. But now the tide of in, intellectual scholarship on these kind of issues has turned yet again. New data has emerged today that has led scientists to think that the sexes were different and that these differences are established in the human brain during development in the womb. At conception, an embryo has neither male nor female genitalia, but around the six week fetal of fetal life, a genetic switch flips and chromosomes direct the precursors of gonads to develop in the testes or ovaries. These gonads, if testes, begin to produce fetal testosterone. As this hormone surges through embryonic tissue during the third month of life, it builds the male genital genitalia and also patterns the male brain. Similarly, if the embryo is to be a girl, it develops without the stimulus of male hormones, and female genitals emerge along with the female brain. Several scientists think that this brain architecture plays a role in creating gender differences that appear later in life. In the TED Talk that you listened to for today, Helen Fisher talks about some of the differences that we see 
in the male and female brain. In, in groups with people uh, next to you, if you're live in class, I want you to talk about some of the differences that she mentions in how uh, men and women uh, think and behave. So take a couple moments, uh, if you're watching this at home, to write down some ideas and check your notes. So Helen Fisher identifies four common gender differences linked to differences in the male and female brain. Verbal abilities, math abilities, intuition, and aggression. These gender differences have developed over time and likely began as men and women began to pair and raise their young as husband and wife in the distant past. So let's start out first with the gift of gab and the math gap. In tests of verbal abilities among Americans, on average, little girls speak sooner than boys. They also tend to speak more fluently with greater grammatical accuracy and with more words per sentence. By age 10, girls excel at verbal reasoning, written prose, verbal memory, pronunciation, as well as spelling. International Association for the Evaluation of Educational Achievement reported that out of some 43,000 writing samples of students in 14 countries on five different continents, girls expressed their thoughts more clearly on paper. Now, this is not to say that boys are inarticulate or that all boys have weaker verbal skills than all girls, but scientists are beginning to agree that on average, women exhibit more verbal skills than men. Of course, these gender differences in verbal abilities are partially learned. A host of arguments uh, has been made that verbal skills are instilled more regularly in girls than boys. The most compelling argument, however, for a link between biology and verbal skills has been found in studies of estrogen. So in a study of 200 women of reproductive age between 15 and 49, psychologists had women repeat the following tongue twister. A box of mixed biscuits is a biscuit mixer. And they had them repeat this tongue twister five times fast, five times fast. So think if you could actually do this. I don't think I could actually uh, say this five times fast and have it make sense. What they showed from this study is that during the middle of a, a woman's monthly menstrual cycle, when estrogen levels were at their peak, women were at their best verbally. That means that they could say the tongue twister clearly five times fast better when their estrogen levels were at were at their highest. Directly after menses, when estrogen levels were much lower, these women's speech, uh, speech frequency uh, and ability to uh, repeat this tongue twister actually declined. But even at their worst, most of the women in this study outstripped men on this verbal task of repeating the tongue twister. So while some of these studies point to women having better verbal skills on average, men tend to excel on average at higher math problems. They are also generally better at reading maps and solving mazes. Some of these skills appear early on in childhood. Little boys tend to take toys apart and explore how to put them back together and uh, how to kind of track objects in space much better. They're also better at seeing abstract patterns and relationships more accurately. At puberty, boys begin to outstrip girls in other kind of applied mathematics like algebra and geometry. In one test of nearly 50,000 seventh graders who took the SAT, 260 boys and 20 girls scored over 700 out of 800 on math problems. That's a ratio of 13 to 1 in terms of boys being better at scoring high on SAT math problems. Like verbal skills in females, these math abilities in boys and men clearly have a large cultural component as well. For instance, how parents train boys and girls shapes society's perception that math is masculine and teachers make assumptions uh, about men being better or boys being better at math and encourage them to pursue math-centric careers and classes in a disproportionate number 
to women. But there's also a link between the male hormone testosterone, the Y chromosome, and excellence in certain visual spatial quantitative skills. For example, pubescent boys with low levels of testosterone do poorly on spatial tasks. Moreover, men with an extra Y chromosome, having an XYY uh, chromosomal pattern, score higher on visual spatial tests, which makes it seem like there's a link between the Y chromosome and visual spatial skills. Men with an extra female chromosome, on the other hand, men who have an XXY pattern, have poorer spatial aptitude, which again, provides some kind of correlational evidence that the X chromosome may be uh, associated with uh, less aptitude for spatial skills. An important caveat here is that women also have spatial aptitude. Scientists Erwin Silverman and Marion Beals have shown that women have a unique spatial skill set that's different from men. Silverman and Beals displayed several dissimilar objects in a room and drawn on a piece of paper. And then they asked men and women to memorize the objects they saw. Then they asked the participants to recall what they had memorized. The results, women were able to remember a greater number of stationary objects and their locations than men in the study. So is biology destiny? Absolutely not, not at all. But from an anthropological perspective, these gender differences may make evolutionary sense. As ancestral males began to scout and track and surround animals millennia ago, those males who were good at maps and mazes survived disproportionately. Ancestral women, on the other hand, needed to locate food within an elaborate matrix of vegetation instead. So they actually developed a superior ability to remember locations of stationary objects as shown in the Beale study, the Silverman and Beale study. A different spatial talent associated with hunting and gathering than those needed for hunting. So as pair bonding emerged and human hunting and gathering traditions took shape, so did these kind of subtle differences in spatial abilities between men and women. The next thing I want to talk about are the two other things that Helen Fisher identifies as kind of gender differences in the brain, woman's intuition and male aggression, or the, or, uh, the phrase, boys will be boys. All right, let's start with uh, woman's intuition. So scientists are beginning to demonstrate that on average, women read emotions, context, and all sorts of peripheral nonverbal information more effectively than men. The ability to read the subtle movements of others could be linked to brain anatomy. Specifically, the corpus callosum, that bundle of nerve fibers that connects the two sides of the brain, thickens and bulges towards the rear of a woman's brain, but is uniformly cylindrical for the male brain. This makes the two sides of female brains actually better connected because of the more bundled nerve uh, formation of the corpus callosum than for men. This particular brain circuiting offers an explanation for women's intuition. Women may absorb cues from a wider range of visual, oral, tactile, and olfactory senses simultaneously. Then they can connect these bits of information more uh, seamlessly. This kind of biological component of women's intuition likely involved in large part to help women detect the needs of their growing infants millennia ago. In addition to feminine intuition, women of all ages have better fine motor coordination, which is also likely linked to that formation, uh, particular formation of the colossum corpus in the female brain. This female dexterity even increases during the middle of the menstrual cycle when estrogen levels are at their highest, pointing to a physiological element to fine manual skills. In contrast, men are on average more dexterous at gross mo motor skills, requiring things like speed and force, like running, jumping, and throwing, 
all skills that would have been evolutionary advantageous in the past. So once again, these gender differences make evolutionary sense. As ancestral women picked more seeds and berries and plants, those with superior fine motor dexterity may have survived disproportionately, selecting for this trait in subsequent generations. On the other hand, it seems likely that as men hurled more weapons at predators and moving animals, a male aptitude for gross motor skills emerged in the deep past. As Darwin noted, men are, on average, more aggressive, and women do more nurturing. So Darwin was right about that. In a study of villages in Japan, the Philippines, Mexico, Kenya, India, and New England, anthropologists Beatrice and John Whiting found that boys were more aggressive in each culture, showing that aggression transcends cultural determinism. Psychologists confirmed this in Americans which demonstrates that rough and tumble play is almost exclusively a male preoccupation throughout childhood, as it is in other primates, like our distant ape ancestors. The vast majority of homicides around the world are committed by men, often by young men with high levels of testosterone, providing a tangential evidence that testosterone is likely linked, high levels of testosterone is linked to aggression. This aggression certainly would have served men well as they confronted predator, predators and enemies in the grasslands of Africa a few million years ago. Nurturing is often considered to be the female counterpart to male aggression. Women of every ethnic group and culture show more interest in infants and more tolerance of their needs. Infant girls chatter, smile, and coo to people's faces more, while boys are just as likely to babble at objects. <laughs> Infant girls are also more sensitive to touch, sound, voice inflection, taste, and smell. Girls are more attracted to new people, while boys are drawn to novel toys. Girls are also better at discerning your emotional state from your tone of voice. All of these traits are useful in rearing young. Psychologist Carol Gilligan has also shown that women have an outstanding sensitivity for interpersonal relationships. Data indicates that this behavior may also have biological foundations. Individuals born with one X chromosome show less interest in sports, score extremely low on math tests, and are very interested in marriage and strongly drawn to children. These studies suggest that the X chromosome may be linked to women's sensitivity to interpersonal relations. While men and women on average seem to be endowed with varying spatial, verbal, and intuitive skills, as well as differences in aggressiveness and nurturing behaviors, nevertheless, neither women or men is more intelligent than others. Here, Darwin was wrong. So one of the things I'm interested in hearing from you guys about are what are some of the biggest differences you think exist between men and women when it comes to love and intimacy? So take a couple moments if you're uh, watching this at home to write down some notes about the differences you see between men and women when it comes to intimacy. This is the type of question that you might want to use for your third commentary uh, as a focus on gender. So, gender traits may explain some misunderstandings between the sexes when it comes to things like intimacy, monogamy, and marriage. Specifically, we as humans struggle with intimacy. Women tend to derive intimacy from talking, a form of intimacy that comes from their long prehistory as nurturers and verbal communicators. In poll after book after article, women express their disappointment that their mates do not talk about their problems, do not express their emotions, and don't listen and don't share verbally. Sociologist Harry Broad reports that men seek intimacy through working or playing side by side, while women view intimacy as talking face to face. For instance, men often report deriving intimacy from playing and watching sports. What is, a uh, what is a football game but a puzzle? 
a kind of spatial action, aggressive competition, all of which engage and appeal to the male brain. Another variation in, in standards of intimacy may stem from our ancestry. Psychologists argued that women are more, more regularly seek to feel included, connected, and attached, while men more often enjoy space, privacy, and autonomy. Women's drive to be included may come from a time when women's roles as nurturers selected for those who felt comfortable in a group. And men's need to seek autonomy may harken back to those days when men made their living as solitary, stealthy scouts and trackers hunting game. We may have some sexual tastes that come from our distant past as well. For instance, men's sexual fantasies are regularly aroused by visual stimuli of all sorts. Perhaps these partialities in part are directed by their more spatial brains. In contrast, Women, on average, like forms of verbal porn, like romance novels and soap operas on TV, a preference likely linked to their sensitivity to language. Of course, this is not to say that all men are voyeurs and feel invaded by their wives or derive intimacy from sports, right? Nor do all women uh, read romance novels or derive intimacy from talking face to face. This is simply to say that these gender differences in conduct have been recorded and are consistent, generally consistent across larger groups. Studies of male and female suggest that some of these kind of modern differences between genders actually preceded our, distant, uh, our descent uh, onto the grasslands of Africa as Homo sapiens. So male chimps in East Africa stalk, chase, and kill animals. These are spatial and aggressive tasks. They also throw more foliage, rocks, and have gross motor habits that are better than female chimps. In contrast, female chimps gather. They engage in termite fishing and ant dipping more often than males, and these are the sorts of tasks that require actually minute, fine manual dexterity. Female chimps also engage in more social grooming and interact more with their young through touch and vocalization than male chimps. As our forebears began to hunt and forage, these gender roles must have become critical to survival, selecting for today's male and female differences in spatial and verbal skills, as well as things like intuition, hand-eye coordination, and aggressiveness. The idea that kind of man, our, our distant male ancestors were scouts, trackers, explorers, and hunters and protectors, in contrast, to women as kind of gatherers, nurturers, mediators, and educators have these kind of prehistoric origins that we have some archeological evidence for. So of course we don't have a physical evidence that survived the two million years ago of male hunting or female gathering, but we do have uh, some material evidence that uh, comes from the Olduvai Gorge in Tanzania that um, our ancestors were making caches of stone tools and raw materials specifically used to butcher meat from hunting. There's also these kind of large discrete uh, refuge dumps filled with uh, large animal bones that have been kind of disarticulated, which suggests that people have begun to butcher, carry, and share meat. These caches indicate that our ancestors coordinated their activities uh, in, around hunting large animals delayed eating, and carried um, out these kind of joint uh, tasks uh, around specific locations. It is highly unlikely that many ancestral females, often burdened with small kids, would have engaged in dangerous hunting activities. Although we may never know which early peoples first began to do separate tasks, at the, the same time, there's no reason to think that either sex had rigid formal roles. Probably females without children joined and even led scavenging and hunting parties. And certainly men often gathered plants, nuts, and berries. What the archeological record does show is that roughly two million years ago, the sexes had started to make their living as a team, setting the stage for the development of monogamy and the modern relationship of women, men, and 
and power. So the D2L quiz answer today is blue. Make sure to uh, uh, fill out the quiz and push that the answer to today is blue. And I will see you all next week.